I'm really looking forward to this theme because the Lord started speaking to me late last year about the fact that even though we, we've come out of COVID and we're trying to sort of like get back momentum in our lives, we're still kind of, kind of wobbly and we haven't really fully got back to that place. And the Holy Spirit is very integral in this taking place. So here's what I want to start with one statement and that's this one. If you want meaning and longevity in life, you'll need the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you want meaning and longevity in life, before I had in it, and I actually regret now that I didn't stick with it because I wanted to say that if you want meaning in life and longevity in it, whatever it is, your marriage, your life, your work situation, your relationships, you will need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. He is the actioner. He actions whatever the Father and the Son direct. Now, I don't know about you, but I can remember times when I've encountered the Holy Spirit over years in my life, and it's been amazing. And when you have actually felt the tangible presence of God, you are actually, actually never the same again. The old Pentecostal guys used to say, once you've had a taste of heaven, you are spoiled for this earth. Nothing actually will actually resolve that ache in, within you. It only comes from that relationship with the Holy Spirit. I've had supernatural healings take place in my own life. When doctors said, that's it, we can't fix it, there's nothing you can do, go home, die. The Holy Spirit says, I got a better idea. How about we give you resurrection life and bleeding kidneys suddenly stop bleeding. And the doctors are marveling about what's taken place. I have this all the time where I'm talking to people and then suddenly the Holy Spirit just starts talking to me about their life and things that's going on. And I'm receiving information that I could not know because I have no relationship with them. And I go, I don't know, I'm, is, I, this might be God, it might not happen. Does this mean anything to you? And then, and God's doing some stuff in their life. The Holy Spirit is there moving all the time. I've had it in miraculous provision. My wife and I, when we first started our journey, we were in a little one-bedroom flat with the cockroaches were about that big <laughs> in Annerley. And uh, we, this one flat, it was, it was so cute. It's like you could go like this and get into the bedroom, like <laughs> this to the dining room. It was wonderful, very little to clean. But we were living on nothing. And we were always trusting God to just meet the needs and, and I think I was in Bible college and I needed $200 to uh, get these textbooks so I could actually start the next whatever it was that I had to do and they'd been asking for it for a while I didn't have it, it was, I couldn't get it and so like oh, I'm going oh, what am I going to do and so we go in and we sit down in a class and we do our devotions and I do my devotions and I read and that's and great yeah then he gets up and teaches and does his thing rah 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 and I go great great and then of course at the end of it it's like well we need the money, you know. If you've got to get these books, otherwise you can't go into the next course. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Well, so then he said, let's sing a song and then we'll get the money. I said, okay, fair enough. That's the way it always happens in church life. Song first, then money. <laughs> so anyway, you know, we, we're singing away and then he goes, <laughs> he goes, okay. And he starts rattling off people that need to deliver money. And I know I've got no money. And I'm sitting there and he goes, and I just got this whisper, open your Bible. And I'm going, What? And he goes, now open your Bible. And I go, Lord, I don't need to read about money. I need money. I need it tangibly. He goes, now open your Bible. And now he calls my name out and says, okay, have you got your $200? And I just flicked it open and there was four $50 notes. Mint condition, sitting right inside. I've been using this for the last hour. There's nothing in there. And I go, as a matter of fact, I do have the money. And I paid it over. Now, I still don't know where that money came from. I don't know whether God just instantly printed it or whether he took it out of someone else's pocket in the room. I don't know. But, but he did it and it was miraculous. But this is how the Holy Spirit works. And if you want, if you want meaning and longevity in, in anything in your life, you need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Anita's talking about. You can't do this life on your own. You cannot live the Christ-centered life without the power of the Holy Spirit. What about you? 
Can you think back right now? Can you remember moments when you experienced the tangible presence of God doing something that you, you just knew that was just supernatural? Like, I'm going to do something here I don't often do, but it, can you just give us a raise your hand in the room? And you guys online, if you're online, just put us there. Have, have you, how many of you have actually experienced God do something very, very, like that was just no way that could be anything else other than God, the Holy Spirit broken? Okay, so probably about 50%. Okay. I don't know what it is online, but we'll catch up a bit later. Now, I did something during the week where I, I asked for people to let me know how the Holy Spirit had been leading them when I sent out communication. And I got a big fat zero response, which means one of two things. Uh, our communication sucks, which could be the case. I'll admit that. It could be that. Or um, this next statement is really important that uh, so many of us are settling for a spiritless life. Why are we settling for that? Now, I want to just make a point about this right off the bat because it's actually impossible for any human being, no matter how good or bad or what they are, to live a spiritless life. You can't have no spirit whatsoever because in the book of Acts it says this, for in him we live and move and breathe and have our being. It says in him we live and move. We, we, we have our being. The very breath that you draw and every human being draws is the fact that you are in God. He's part of that breath. He's part of what those guys were talking about, that Ruach. It's the breath of life. Everything. If God was to pull away, you would simply cease to exist. So you, nobody can actually be without some dimension of the Holy Spirit. But if you want the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you, and you want to have meaning and longevity, you're going to have to pursue a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So the question is, why, why do so many people live less spiritual aware in lives, less spiritual activity in their life? And it comes down to, I've already said the word, the first thing is, some people are just unaware. They are just unaware that there even is a Holy Spirit. Uh, Apollos was going down, I think he was going down to Corinth and Paul was going down to Ephesus. And Paul gets into Ephesus and he finds a group of uh, disciples down there and he says this to them. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And then he goes on and dialogue. He said, well, what on earth have you been baptized into? I'll baptize into John. That was a baptism of repentance about Jesus who was coming, but you haven't been baptized into Jesus. Ah, oh, and then that goes on a whole journey. And he lays hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, as unbelievable as that would seem to um, some of you guys here, there are places with, that you could visit where the Holy Spirit is never spoken about. I know people that have sat in churches their entire life and never heard a sermon on the Holy Spirit. Now, why? Well, this could be any number of reasons why. The least of is that you feel out of control because you're not in control. And that's exactly the point is how it should be. But some people have never heard. They are unaware. Now, for us, we think that's crazy because you hear about the Holy Spirit every week. Every week, every day, if you're around here, the Holy Spirit is mentioned every single day because we understand without the Holy Spirit, nothing happens. Nothing transpires of any longevity, of any effectiveness. Remember, back at the start, he's hovering over the waters and he's waiting for God to speak. And when God speaks, he actions. I think it's very interesting the Holy Spirit hovers over the waters waiting for God to speak and then he actions. What percentage of you is water? That's 70, 75%. I think he's still hovering over the water and he's still waiting for the word to be spoken so he can activate change. You've just got to become aware. Now, in case you're going, oh, well, that's enough for you to say, but how do I know that's true? Here's our mission statement. What does it say, our mission statement? To partner with the Holy Spirit. Who's leading this thing? The Holy Spirit. Partner with the Holy Spirit. Teach people to love God, love others, make disciples. 
So the Holy Spirit is the initiator. If you go to our family values, you're going to find that the top family value is to be spirit-led. Why? Because this is the only way this life works. It's the only way it works. So many people go about trying to build something for God and they frustrate and they're exhausted. And I go, it's because you're doing it wrong. Think of, think of doing something for God like riding waves. Let God make the wave. You just ride the wave. But if you're going to stand out there and first try and make the wave and then you're going to ride it, you're going to be exhausted and you're going to get nothing done. So that's why we're Spirit-led. We're forever listening to the Holy Spirit. So when it comes to our mission, which comes out of the Great Commission, we're married to that. But we're only dating the model. And if a better model comes along, we're switching. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to. But the mission stays the same. The, the key thing that we use on this is our soap devotions. And I don't know if some of you may have never seen Pastor Wayne Cadero. There might be a photo of him. I'm not sure. He's a good looking man, similar to myself. Um, yes, uh, he's a great friend, great mentor to our church. Uh, he's now left Hawaii. He's up in, thank you, Oregon, someone knows. Uh, but he, he created the soap devotion plan. He spent over a decade putting it together so you could see what, how God dealt with Israel under the old covenant and then how it passes through and you see it under the new. But that is the process that we use to keep us connected, connected to God and that the Holy Spirit can work on to conform us to the image of Christ. Because our vocation is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Start becoming more like Him, more perfect, more holy, and then helping other people start the journey. So some people, some people resist just because they're not aware. Now, you don't have that problem anymore because you've been here this morning, so you've got it all right there. Now, second thing is, and this is a bit different, some people resist the Holy Spirit. Further on in Acts, it says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts, that's never a good thing. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Now, resisting the Holy Spirit is a very, very dangerous thing to do on an ongoing basis. Now, this is where I differ with probably a bunch of other theologians in the world, and you might want to go with them. I think there is, there is enough indication in here in both Old and New Covenant to see that God does not strive with the heart of human beings forever. There, it reaches a point when He knows, if, you, if you're not serious about this and you're not going to grow, then I think He does some things about it. And so what you discover here is like a rich young ruler came to Jesus some of the things that I, makes me think about it. And he says to Jesus, okay, what have I got to do? What have I got to do to make it into heaven? And he goes, well, you know the commands. And he's, he's rattling off the law and he's rattling off. Yeah, yeah, all those I've done. All I've done. I've done all those since I was a kid. And then Jesus just goes, oh, but there's one thing that you lack. The one thing that you lack, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And then it goes on and he says, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy and he walked away. Now, some people will use this to say all rich people need to go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He wasn't making that statement. You should never normalize one-off accounts within scripture. He did it to this guy because he knew what was going on in this guy's heart and he knew that this man, his identity and his career and his wealth and his status was the very thing that was stopping him from being able to actually receive that which he's after. He's done all the law stuff. He's tried the legalistic religious stuff. It's not working. And all he's got to do is come to that place of loving God with all his heart, all his mind, soul and strength, but he can't do it because he, he goes, oh, this is getting in the way. Someone said to me last week, that thing about career, that was so challenging. I was really a bit offended by it. I said, no, it's okay. You can go, okay, it's fine. You can work through that. I said, yeah, I was just offended because it's not all about me. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized, wow, it really is all about me. And they said it was challenging. But then at the end, when I got to the point of working it through and say, I do have this thing. This has become an idol. I'm relying on it to save me and save my family. And that's wrong. So then when that happens, I got to switch. I would really like to take this ugly thing off my face if that's the case, but I can't because I'm in the middle of something. What was I talking about? 
Oh, yeah. And so she had that revelation. She said, wow, okay. But the more I thought about it, the more I realised I am doing that. And then when I reached that place where it was, oh, wow. So God, really God is in control of that as well. Yes. Then she said, no, that was so incredibly freeing because it doesn't all hinge on me. It doesn't hinge on me. Our role is to be conformed to the image of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's what He's doing. His will is for us to be holy as He's holy, be perfect as He's perfect. And then go make disciples. How you want to do that? Whatever. He says, I don't, I'm not worried. Do whatever you want to do as long as you do those things. Then. So I kind of think of career as more like how you're going to deploy your vocation and you can choose however you want to do that. So they're the two things that go on with someone. They'll either unaware of the Holy Spirit and then you have to help them or they resist the Holy Spirit and that has a whole gamut of other issues associated with it. You know, Jesus told, told stories about talents. He said people didn't use their talent. Master said, you go off and do this, invest this, do this. When he comes back and says, you've done nothing with it, takes it off him, gives it to someone else and says, now get out of here. You can go to where there's weeping and gnashing your teeth. That's not a good place. Jesus talked about, about trees. Master coming to look for trees. There's no fruit on the trees. Why is there no fruit on the trees? Well, this guy says, well, I'll, give me another year and I'll work at it. And if you come back in another year, that's it. Then we'll just get rid of the trees. So that resisting over a long period of time, I think is a serious issue that you do need to be careful with. But when you're walking with the Holy Spirit, He'll do a few things to help you through this. If you choose not to resist and you choose to listen to what He has to say, even if it's a bit uncomfortable, even if it's a bit of a pebble in your soul, then here's what He does. He comforts you. He says He's the comforter. And He says He'll abide with you forever. So when you hear something that's challenging, He's there to comfort you in it and says, I know this is tough. I know you don't want to let go of this. But this thing is taking the place of me. I can't let you hang on to it. Otherwise, you're going to compromise everything, your eternity. So He puts His finger on things. And He comforts you in there. You have to be able to sit in the tension sometimes when you know the Holy Spirit is challenging you on something, what we want to do is get out of tension. We all hate tension, but there's no momentum without tension. So you've got to have some. And he puts it on there as a tension and you process and you work it through. And then he begins to counsel you because he's the spirit of truth. So he tells you the truth about the situation. He tells the truth about your, your mental position on your sexuality or your thoughts about marriage or your attitude towards money or debt or your spouse or even the way that you're living your life. Some people try and come to Christ and think that they can live it by the way of legalistic laws and they don't, they don't understand why it doesn't work because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The Holy Spirit works directly with the human heart directly from God. It's not about laws anymore. It's not about regulations anymore. It's about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and allowing Holy Spirit out of that place of health then to teach you how to love others. Someone caught up on last week when I said, you said live from imbalance. And she said, I've been thinking about that. I said, yeah. Do you hold to that? I said, absolutely. Because if you live from a place of imbalance when it comes to God, so if you love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, it makes you a consistent you, right? So you're in the centre of this. Then when I love my spouse, because I'm going to love my neighbour, that's the first one, I'm still consistent in the middle. And then I love my kids. And then I go out here and I love my family and friends. And then I go out here and I go, but I remain consistent in the middle. Nothing changes. If you can live... I think if you can get to the place of loving God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength from a place of imbalance towards Him, you'll end up in perfect balance with the whole world because you're consistent in who you are. People see me all the time at different places. You're no different to what you are on the platform. Yep, you're no different when you're out there sweeping or cleaning or anything like that. You're no different when you're down the beach. Well, sometimes... In attire, sometimes in attire, I'm never doing that again. But sometimes, you know, but people can't get past the fact that I am no different anywhere I go 
it frustrates some people. You know, some people like, particularly if I have to get invited to a, uh, like a well-to-do kind of Mary kind of thing, and I go like this. It's like everyone else has got their ties on. They're all trying to impress people and suck up to people. No, this is who I am. I live consistently from who I am. So that place of imbalance puts me in balance with everyone. Everyone sees consistently. Otherwise, you get this duplicity going on. You, you're like over here with one people, someone else, and a different group of people. You're something different, different again. And then you get this kind of duplicity going on. And then people don't know, well, who are you? And it actually becomes counterproductive. So the Holy Spirit, I believe, counsels us to remain singular. We're singular before Him. But for me, when it comes to counsel, I still, my, my greatest counsel happens in soap devotion meetings, 6.30 a.m. out here on Wednesday, usually three or four guys around a table. And I come there and we just sit for the first 20 minutes and we read and then we write and then we start to share because because we, we can't really talk until Georgia makes the coffee at seven. So, so <laughs> speech doesn't come out. But then we come out and we start talking and then we bring things out and we, we're grappling what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And, and, and I'll bring this thing out here and then Gareth will throw something and go, oh, wow, I didn't see that. And then Taylor, he'd say something, it's over here. So by the time I leave, instead of having a revelation like that, I have a collective revelation like this big because the Holy Spirit is counselling us. He comforts us and sometimes it gets quite tense in our soap devotion because we disagree on things and we butt heads and that's like, oh. But we're trying to grapple with the Holy Spirit about what He's saying to us. Now, what happens after you go through the, the comfort and then the counsel? Then it gets to a very uncomfortable place and that's where your conviction sometimes will come. Sometimes you get convicted of sin. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will just say, that's just not appropriate and you need to change that. He convicts of sin. This is all the areas. I, I think this is one of the key weaknesses within the church in the West is we've kind of like told people you can raise your hand, pray a prayer, you're going to heaven and carry on and live however you want. And that's not the gig at all. You know, the Holy Spirit, once the Holy Spirit enters and comes inside, now his, now his job is to actually rebirth every area inside you so that it lines up with Scripture. It lines up with the teachings of Jesus as outworked by the apostles. So therefore, He's continually pressing on things. And, you know, I've had times in my life where I've just been going, so good. And I, I feel like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm doing okay here. I, I'm doing okay, Lord. And so I let the Lord know that I'm doing okay. And I pray, He goes, I'll pray this prayer of David's. And I go, I'd rather not. He goes, yeah, could you? And David's prayer was, Lord, test me and try me and see if there be any way of iniquity in me. Um... After you pray that for about four hours and he starts talking to you about a bunch of stuff, you go, you know what, let's just, let's just dump that prayer of David's for a second. Uh, I got a little bit more to work on. We'll always have something to work on. We're a continual work in progress until we reach the place that God wants us to be, which is with him eternally. So when it comes to sin, no one likes to talk about sin. It's an evil world, word in this world. Sin just means missing the mark. It means that you can miss God's best for you in your marriage. You can miss God's best for you in the times of your youth if you muck it up. You can miss it in your marriage. You can miss it in your work, anything like that. It just means missing the mark. It's actually an archery term. So if, if, you, have a, if you see an archer's board, if you're in the centre, that's the centre of God's will. That's it. That's the perfect place to go. Every area away you are is classed as a sin. So it's your one sin away, your two sin away. So the Holy Spirit is continually trying to move us to the center because when you drop into the center on an area, that's where you drop into meaning and longevity because it's being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when you do, when that happens, things begin to change. So you'll get confronted by something. Someone will say something, maybe me, maybe someone else. Someone, the Holy Spirit will speak to you, devotions, and you'll have two choices to do with it right then. Number one, you won't be able to say you're unaware because you've been in this meeting, so you'll be aware. So the two choices you have is you will either repent, another really bad word in today's society, oh, we don't like that word. It means change your mind. It means turn around and go the opposite direction. So you repent to line up so that 
God can get you back to the center of his plan and purpose and will. You might need to ask forgiveness in that. But he compels us towards holiness. But any area that you and I grow in that moves into that center, moves into that holiness, everybody around us enjoys the benefits of it. They reap the rewards of you because when you move into a new place in God, in holiness, there is a blessing that goes with it and everybody around you gets to actually, yeah, gets the, the benefit of it. Now, of course, you could do the opposite one, which is just resist. And I've had one say to me, I know I got an issue here, but I am not gonna change it. Okay, well, that's between you and the Lord. But when you resist, that means that area in your life, it stays in darkness. It stays in bondage. It lacks freedom. And guess who pays the price for your unwillingness to change? Everybody around you. Because they get the old nature. This whole thing is so important. It's so important because God doesn't always, God doesn't want to strive with us as a people. Israel were horrible. He'd do everything he could for them. And then they go, get all this blessing and wow, this is so wonderful. And the next minute they're off worshiping idols again. And then he'd have to send down some other Vegemites or whoever they are up there and sort them out. And then have to sort them all out. And then they come repenting back. Oh, I'm sorry, God, we've done this. And then he'd restore them back and go, yay, God. And then they'd start having a few drinks and then they forget about everything again. And before you know, they're off again. So we have to find some Marmites and some other ones to come down then. And then sort them out. And that was the, that was the consistency of their relationship. I know people now that do live like that still. Forget about God completely when things are going well. Suddenly the wheels fall off, all crying out to God. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do something else. Please help me. And then God helps them. Eh, back, forget again. We do the same thing. And you will unless you have the Holy Spirit within you, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, helping you to keep your adjusting back to the center. Because there's so much in life that's going to push you away. Push you away. And you can't just keep resisting all the time. I'm going to read to you one scripture about this, which terrifies me as a pastor. Terrifies me because it, it says a lot. He goes on, he says, Not everyone that says to me... No, next one, I, I jumped a couple. Yeah, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The will of my Father. What's the will? To be holy, to be perfect. He's perfect. Okay, right, okay. To do the will of my Father in heaven. Next. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons? This is operating spiritual gifts, by the way. And, in, and did we not perform many miracles? Yes, look at me. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That scares the socks off me because that implies to me that someone that maybe even I look up to on the internet, you can be in a position where it looks like you've got all the gifts, you can do miraculous things, but not be in intimate relationship with God. That's why we never stray far away from the basics around here. The basics. Keeping you connected with Jesus for yourself through the self-devotions, empowered by the Holy Spirit so that He can keep you, conforming you to the image of Christ. That's what it's all about. He is the actioner. God's written down His will. It's written there as well. We know what it is. Now he says, now I just need you to get on board with it. Stop resisting me. If you're unaware, get aware. Now you're aware. Stop resisting and allow me to help you be conformed to the image of Christ. And the more you are conformed to the image of Christ, the greater your witness becomes because you don't look like everybody else in this world. You look and you smell different. You feel different. Your attitude is different. 
Your marriage is different. The way you date, the way you conduct yourself is different. The way you go about your work. And I get, we get some great people here that see their work as worship and it's amazing what's going on. But everything about you is just so different. That's what gives your life meaning and longevity because the Holy Spirit is empowering you through it. I was thinking about the area of forgiveness because I know so many people struggle with this. I mean, I'd battled with it a, a, a lot several years ago, but uh, I, was, I was actually, uh, I don't know why, but I, I, I went on the net and I started looking around about some of the massacres, the shooting massacres that have happened over the years in churches overseas. And I happened to stumble on to one where there was about, about nine uh, African-Americans that were shot and killed in a Bible study by a white uh, 17 year old boy that was totally unrepentant, totally unrepentant. And the judge gave them opportunity <clears throat> to speak to him face to face about what they were feeling. And it was, it was just amazing to listen to how all of them talked, about, you could hear the pain and the sorrow. And they would say, say things like, I am so angry that you have taken away my loved one. I will never see them again. You've robbed me of so much. And they would go on and on. But I forgive you. But I forgive you. And they all went through, one by one, through that process. And you know what? That young man never flinched. He wasn't sorry. One iota about it. But here's the deal. They were being empowered by the Holy Spirit to forgive. Because we think forgiveness, we think forgiveness is about letting them off the hook. Nobody's off the hook. Everybody has to give an account to God for the way they live their lives and the words that they speak. Forgiveness got them off the hook. That young man is not controlling them from that jail anymore. They're free. Why? Because they could forgive. They could forgive. I, I've had people in my office talking to me about someone that they're so angry with, they're so upset with. And I've said to them, let's go talk to them. Come on, let's work this thing out. Come on, let's do this thing. I'll work with you. Oh, we can't. Why not? They've been dead 30 years. I said, are you listening? Are you listening to yourself? They've been dead 30 years and they're still ruling you from the grave. This is not about letting them off the hook. No one's getting off the hook. This is about you letting you off the hook so that you can walk free. But it's like this in every area. The Holy Spirit wants to make sure that we're okay in every area. Man, I tell you what, if we could get everybody empowered by the Holy Spirit, empowered living by the Holy Spirit, everything would change. I'm telling you, everything would change. I want to pray with you for a minute and I'm going to get the team up shortly. But I want you to think about just at the moment, where do you feel like you need the Holy Spirit to come and help you in an area of your life? Where, where, where's an area of your life that you know when it comes to the bullseye? Eh, I'm not quite there. I get some things that I'm hanging on to or I've got some mindsets. And I, I think I tell you, this is so pervasive. Like m m many of us didn't, grow up in church. So you, you come in with so much baggage from, from your past and you, you're living out of your family of origin. There's all that kind of stuff. And we've got some things here that can help you go through that process. But you've got to realise this is what the Holy Spirit was sent for. This is why Jesus said, I have to go that the counsellor will come. Jesus knew he could only be in one place at one time. But he said, the Holy Spirit will be everywhere. He will be in you. He will be upon you. When you gather, He will be there. When two or three come together, He's there. And He's going to be fulfilling the Word of the Father and the Word of Jesus. And as you read Jesus' teaching and the apostles' teaching, you can see why the guys, the old covenant guys of the Lord got so upset because it was so different. It was so radical. They knew they weren't supposed to commit adultery, but they did it anyway. Because you can always justify and you can 
work things around. Well, it wasn't actually adultery because it wasn't actually sex. Hmm, okay. So what was it then? They work it around. See, the, people, the only reason people like laws, sometimes people come in here and go, what's the Ten Commandments around here, buddy? What's your Ten Commandments? I said, I'm not telling you. Because the reason you want to know them is so you figure out how to get around them. There are no Ten Commandments. There's one. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and then love your neighbour. You love each other the way Jesus loved you. Oh, well, that's not very exciting. It will be if you start doing it. It will be if you start doing it because you watch how everything begins to change. In that point, we realise the gateway to this into the awareness, into the Holy Spirit, is understanding Jesus went to the cross for your sins and my sins. He died for our sins. That's what He did. He took our punishment, went down to hell on our behalf. He took that. But because He was pure, because He was holy, and because He was righteous, the Holy Spirit raised Him from the dead. And then he says, now, now anyone can have a relationship back with the Father. But I can't stay here because I have to go so that the Holy Spirit will come. The Comforter, the Counselor, the Convictor. And He will be with you always. He will be in you. He'll be upon you. And He is the one that will empower you to be conformed to the image of Christ. You're going, oh, I can't possibly forgive. No, I know you can't, but I can help you do it. You don't understand what my wife, well, yeah, maybe I don't, but I can teach you how to love her the way that I love her. And the Holy Spirit begins the process. And we realise I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. The life I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself away. You reach that place where the entryway is the resurrection, but you have to go through the doorway of death with him first. So when you surrender your life, you get through waters of baptism. You choose to die with Him so the Holy Spirit can raise you up to live and live like you can't believe. You, you, you just got no idea how dynamic your relationships can be, how dynamic your business can be, how dynamic your life can be, how much exciting things there are out there if you just allow the Holy Spirit to take control because he, he has a better plan for your life than what you do. Let me read the words of this old hymn. I didn't know Nara was doing that before. But I'm going to read the words of this old hymn and I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the team just to play for a minute and then give you an opportunity to just allow the Holy Spirit to come to you and just say, okay, we need to work on this. Let's talk about this. Or just allow Him to have control. It's an old song that says, All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Saviour. I surrender all. Father, we are, uh, we're now aware of the Holy Spirit and the role He does in bringing us comfort and counsel and conviction. As we sing, Lord, would You just bring to our, each of our conscious thoughts uh, now areas where we need to surrender more fully because the reality is we, you can be in our lives and there can still be parts of our lives that we haven't surrendered. But would you help us to be able to surrender completely to you? May we stop resisting in whatever area it is and just start asking you to lead us and guide us so we grow into the image of Christ. We fulfill the vocation you've got for us to be fully devoted followers of you, but love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then out of that, love our neighbours as ourselves. Fill us afresh as we sing, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.